so just as a, um, as a fairly quick review, um, a week ago we ended here with a sequential importance sampling algorithm that doesn't have any resampling as part of it, and we saw that that failed. Um, I showed you it on a car tracking example um, that I'll use for a lot of examples because it's multimodal and yet it's simple, and it's, um, it's a one-dimensional tracker, so it's really good for seeing how well the different state-space tracking algorithms perform. It's a really simple but nice benchmark. And uh, as we went through, we developed the model. I tried to give you a sense of how engineers often develop both measurement models and process models from the kind of domain knowledge they have to work with. And we ended up with this as our state-space model with only a little bit of hand-waving. Um, and then we talked a little bit about the particle filter design. Uh, I chose the, um, the prior as the importance density, 500 particles because it's in one dimension and that's ample for uh, the number of modes that are in the posterior. That's more than enough for accurate tracking and, uh, and doesn't require more computation than I have to work with. And then um, we had to, we, we put it and we saw that the weights all went to zero and it stopped tracking very well after a very short period of time. And then we started talking about, well, um, in general, when you can't do the optimal tracking, when you can't create that image that I just showed you on the previous slide, how do we display the posterior? And so we took kind of a, a sidetrack on to talking about a simple form of density estimation with, uh, with what's called kernel density estimation, using these kernels where the kernels have, uh, it turns out, properties that are similar to probability uh, density functions in that they're non-negative and they integrate to have unit area. And I gave you kind of a quick tutorial on a basic form of density estimation that, that works pretty well, but trying to keep in mind that there, there are deep courses on this, there's much better ways of doing this. Uh, this works pretty well in one dimension, you have to be careful in multiple dimensions. And the most important property uh, of these, or the most important parameter, is not the type of kernel you use, but rather the, um, the width of the kernel you use. And you have to be careful, it can be misleading if you're not careful. And I don't think I mentioned this last time, but in practice, when you're using the kernel density estimation, um, and I talked a little bit about some of the computational uh, aspects, doing it in multiple dimensions, don't try it in more than one. And then we saw an example here. And um, in practice, the, a good way to use this is to plot for in dimension, individual state dimensions to plot what the posterior is as a function of time. And if you see anything, any point where it's multimodal, you have to be a little bit careful as to whether that's really multimodal or if it's an artifact of your density estimator because it's just an estimate. And sometimes things like this, which are, would technically be a mode, is really just an artifact of the estimation. So if you applied this to a Gaussian and you didn't have very many particles and you didn't use, used a very narrow um, kernel width, then it may appear to be multimodal like it does here. I think there's really only one mode there, but it looks a little bit multimodal. Um, and you have to be careful about that. And one way to check that is if you rerun it again, uh, with different particles that are generated, or with a random number generator that is seen as differently, do your modes move around or do they stay more or less in the same place? That's one test you can use to figure out whether you're really looking at something that is multimodal or if it's just the um, variation due to your, your kernel density estimation. You can also try it with more particles. If you try it with 500 particles and then you try it again with Ten th or a thousand particles. If you double the number of particles, do you see some of this variation go away in what looks like a, a different mode, or does it does it stay there? You know, in the limit, when you have an infinite number of particles, um, it, it, under certain conditions, the kernel density estimate will converge to the true density estimate. So, as you add more particles, if the modes remain, if you do multiple runs and the modes remain, that's a good sign that you're dealing with a multimodal distribution and you don't want to use something like an incentive common filter or extended common filter. Um, it's not complete. It's, it's kind of a necessary condition, but not sufficient, because it may be that if you're only plotting a single dimension, you know, in this case we had a state that was only a scalar, and so there, there aren't multiple dimensions to consider, but in general this is going to be a vector. Usually you're, you're, you're doing these methods on uh, tracking a state where it's a vector,
And when you look at it this way, for one of the state dimensions, you're only looking at one of the dimensions. And even if, when you look at, at kind of the marginal of a single dimension, if it looks unimodal, it could be multimodal when you look at the higher dimensional space. But looking at the higher dimensional space is really hard, especially if you're trying to go more, looking at more than two elements of the state vector at a time. Um, it just, you, it's, it's very difficult to visualize. And um, the rule of thumb that I apply personally in, in my own research, in my own applications, is if I have reason to think that it's multimodal and I look at images like this driven off of the particle filter um, and I look at it for each dimension of the state vector one at a time, if it's unimodal as it is to start down here um, in each of those state dimensions, then, then I think, well, that's a pretty good sign that even in the higher dimensional space, it's still unimodal. It's not rigorous, um, but for practical engineering applications, it's, it's usually a, a pretty good indicator. Usually that's, it's almost always true that if it's multimodal, you'll see it when you look at, at the individual state dimensions. So you don't have to try to visualize it simultaneously in more than one, one element of the state vector. So that's my, um, my guidance. I didn't really give that guidance last time, but that's my guidance for um, trying to get a handle on wh whether you're working with something that's multidimensional or not. Um, the other thing that you can look at is just the um, design of your state space model. You know, if you see a sinusoid in there, <laughs> then that's a good sign that you're going to have uh, multiple modes, as we had in, in one of the earlier examples. Uh, in this case, we've got arc tangents, and I think there's a few sines and cosines. But we know by the, the, um, by the nature of the problem where we've got a car going around a track and we're just pointed to see, seeing what's happening uh, basically with, uh, we've got kind of a, um, uh, something that's tracking the, the heading of where the car is on the track over time. And uh, when it's at this point, knowing it can go backwards or forwards, we know from the design of the model and the nature of the model that there's an ambiguity at that point where going forward in time a little bit, the car may actually go backwards or it may go forwards around the track because this car is, is really erratic and it does end up going in, in reverse sometimes and that what, that's what causes this kind of split. But we could have anticipated, if we thought really carefully, that there will be times when the posterior is multimodal because the nature of our measurement model is such that there is an ambiguity. In the example from the CAPE article, I believe uh, our measurement model was it was something like the square. the square of the state, and of course, if you know plus, I think there was additive uh, measurement noise in that case, and of course, if you're squaring something, then there's an ambiguity as to whether you're looking at something that's positive or negative. So again, that's something that could have told us just from the math that the posterior is probably going to be multimodal because there's an, an ambiguity there where there's more than one distinct location where the state could be. It's not just ambiguity because our measurements are noisy but it's an ambiguity because of the nature of the nonlinearity in our measurement model. So it's another place you can look to kind of try to gauge as to whether you're looking at something that's potentially multimodal or, or unimodal. And it's not easy. I mean, it requires some experience and good judgment, but those are um, the tips I have to offer you as to how you can gather evidence so that if you're presenting a model design or a tracker design in front of your peers, um, you can defend your design decision as to whether to use something like an extended common filter or a particle filter. A particle filter is not the right thing for all applications. Um, it requires a lot of computation, and you, I mean, it, it has some disadvantages. The primary one is computational. So you don't want to just take your most powerful tool and always just blindly apply it. Um, you should do your due diligence and do an investigation of either the, the math and or doing an exploratory analysis, maybe with, initially with a particle filter, to get an initial visual, visualization of what the posterior looks like and see whether there's any convincing evidence that it's multimodal or not. If it's unimodal, then you're probably better off using something like an incentive column filter. And I'll talk more about what that is later in the term, but suffice to say for now, the incentive column filter works beautifully when you've got a unimodal problem, even if you've got a nonlinear state space model. I don't think I said any of that uh, last time, so this isn't quite review, but. I'll, uh, I'll repeat these ideas as we go forward. So the, the basic idea here was things just completely fell apart uh, when we used the simplest of algorithms and uh, when we compare it kind of side by side with what we get from the optimal tracker where this is the true posterior 
it does very well initially up until about uh, time 20, and then it completely breaks apart, and this no longer looks anything like the posterior. And with a little bit of investigation, what we found is that our, uh, we, we came up with a measure of how many weights are actually um, a f are, are contributing significantly to our estimates of both the posterior and of any estimate we derive from, from the posterior. And it's nice because it's bounded between one and the number of particles. It's a really nice measure. And we saw that the number of the effective sample size or the number of effective particles drop precipitously. And by the time we get down to 20, it drops to its lower limit of about one and just kind of stays there for the rest of the time. So basically what we were looking at after 20 samples was really an estimate based on a single particle. And, um, and resampling was uh, the big insight. Uh, these sequential Monte Carlo techniques were apparently known in the 60s based on my reading of the history. But it wasn't until the 90s that people thought about doing resampling, probably because bootstrap techniques in the statistics field were becoming popular then, and computation was getting to the point where you could actually, um, with computers, you could actually think about doing resampling and, and doing tracking with, with large numbers of samples. So it was kind of a convergence of um, some of the techniques being used in statistics and, and, uh, and just having a lot more computation available for driving things like this and practical problems. And so um, we had sampling with replacement, and that means there are kind of winners and losers. Um, and, um, and I'll slow down here. So um, when you're resampling with replacement, and we've got all these weights, um, to do this um, directly would require that you're drawing samples from a uniform distribution, you sort them in order, and, and you're comparing it with a cumulative sum of the weights. And I, um, so if you, if you look at the um, cumulative sum of the weights, the weights can take on um, uh, certain values. Some may be large, and so if you look at like the first weight, maybe it's large. Maybe the next one is small, so there's a little step. Next one may be small. Next one's maybe bigger. You can do this cumulative sum of the weights, and it will look something like a CDF. Um, let's see, so this would be the weight maybe at time i, and this, this is really, the, that would be the vertical height, and this axis is the i-axis, and then this would saturate at a value of 1. And one way of doing resampling is to kind of lay out a bunch of um, uniformly distributed random numbers along this axis, and then you kind of project them over to the right until they hit one of the weights. And the weights that, that are larger, that span a longer distance, will get hit more often when you do this sort of uniform hit. And the ones that have, uh, are small will be, will be hit less frequently. So that's one way of, um, of drawing samples from a uniform distribution, doing, doing this step, uh, sorting them, and then comparing it to this cumulative sum. This is one way in which you could do resampling. It's kind of the straightforward way. Um, but there's a sorting operation here that requires order np log np operations, and it turns out there's a faster way of doing it. There's actually a number of fast ways of doing it, but um, one that's pretty much as good as any is called um, systematic resampling. And I didn't go through this last time, but uh, the way it works is it requires really that you only draw a single uh, uniform, uniformly distributed random number uh, that is between 0 and 1 over the number of particles you're working with. And basically, the way this works is you still have, uh, for each particle, you've got you know, a certain weight. Some of them may be very small, and some of them may be very tall. And some are going to be small. So maybe it looks something like this is sort of a cartoon. So this is the ith weight. So this is weight for particle 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. And the way this works is uh, between uh, 0 and 1 over the number of particles, it draws a single um, random number in this range, and then it lays out just a uniform grid from that point forward and basically projects that grid out until it hits uh, the weights. And so this one that gets hit three times would basically be, be sampled three times. There would be three copies of that particle. And the ones that are, uh, are skipped over, like, uh, like maybe that one hits, and then maybe this one hits down here. So there's one that is skipped over right there. 
um, then that one is not is not selected for resampling. So conceptually, that's how that works. I'm not trying to explain this in great detail, but just give you a sense of how the algorithm works. It's relatively easy to um, to uh, code in. You've got an example of my MATLAB code for coding this in. And, uh, and the important thing is that it's, it's order, the amount of computation required for this is on the order of the number of particles. So it saves you a little bit of computation to be able to do this. Um, so if you may be thinking, well, wait a minute, we've got to do a sort anyway to do the kernel smoothing, but the kernel smoothing you only do for visualization. In practice, when you're tracking, <coughs> you wouldn't be doing that normally. You're only using that in the design and, and, uh, and kind of diagnostic and debugging step where you're trying to visualize what the posterior is doing. But in a real application, uh, you wouldn't, when you've got your tracker actually running, you wouldn't need to visualize the posterior. So you wouldn't have that step where you've got NP log NP, and this one eliminates the only other step that scales NP log NP and, and makes it just order NP. So, so that's good. That makes it a little bit faster. So the computation just scales linearly with the number of particles. I know that was a lot. Let me, let me, let me pause for a minute and give you guys a chance to ask any questions. So the previous one, you, were, is, you had still had the same quasi-CDF step chart, but you chose your Y values with some uniform random distribution. Is that correct? Uh, previously, yeah, this was a uniform set of numbers, and, and they had to be sorted in increasing order to go through and match them up to the weights. But in, in this case, it's, it's a little bit easier because... Um, uh, well, you only have to draw one uniformly distributed random number, and then because you're laying out a grid, you don't, you don't, you know, there's an addition here of where the cut point is, basically, where it's one over NP, because you've got kind of that many steps to take, that many samples that you're going to draw, and so we just add it to what the first one is, where it's, it's scaled by however many particles you're looking at. So it kind of adds a, a uniform step size on top of just that one uniformly distributed random number, and it, it then lays out a grid of however, however many points you need for the number of particles you're working with. I didn't explain that very well. And pre but previously, you were, you were having to pick just a bunch of random numbers, so you were having to do the computations to... Correct. To random yeah, and, and it, you know, it's, I didn't say much about the computation of this, but random number generators are not, um, are not nearly as cheap as a lot of the arithmetic... Um, computations that, that we otherwise do. So, so yeah, this is this is a lot faster. And where was the the sorting required? I guess I missed that. The sorting required before was you've you've got all these uniformly distributed random numbers, but then you have to sort them uh, to um, uh, what was it? Um, you have to sort them to. Or maybe, I can't remember. We, we've got this cumulative sum, and I think you had to sort them because you were moving in order, I think, to figure out how many, how many, how many times this particle, for example, is resampled. Um, and so as you're moving up the cumulative sum, I think you have to do it in order. You can't just, there isn't a way of indexing it where you say, well, I've got a uniformly distributed round number that lands at 0.9, so which weights do I include or not? I think, I think it's just the way it works out. It, the, the main point is that there's a fast way of doing this. It's relatively straightforward. The very last statement, uh, statement there, i to the jth index is equal to i. I'm not following that. So... Well, that just keeps track of the indexes. <coughs> but where is i to the jth used? That's, that's the particle number that is the new particle. That's right. After resampling, uh, the new i, the new... Um, <coughs> that's the first statement. x index j is new x index j is x i. And it looks like we don't need to increase, I mean, to do anything with i. We can just use the old i. Yeah, but we've got to, um, we, we can't wipe them out until, until we, um, we get them all. But I, I, I get 
I think I get your point, which is that we don't we don't need that. There's some slide that says we don't need that. Oh. Some slide, or you did that? You saw it in your reading? No, I think it's in the slides, or maybe it's in one of the papers. So all the weights get a uniform weight of one over mp afterwards mm -hmm. for the new one, and this is the new particle j is equal to the old particle i. So why do we need this anymore? Maybe we don't. That's a good point. So there is a fast way of doing the um, resampling step. And, um, and the big light of the lecture is, uh, you know, after we do the resampling, it does far better. You can see that it, it covers the state. Um, you can see visually whenever resampling occurs and, and you're looking at elements of your state vector. In this case, again, it's a scalar, so we're looking at the whole thing. But in general, you could do this for each dimension of your state vector and, and plot them individually. And whenever there's a resampling, you can visually see all the particles that kind of hit a dead end during the resampling step and were not selected for resampling. And so all the, the ones that were selected were, were the ones that were kind of in this range. And then as they go forward in time, they're still advancing forward in time based on um, our random model of process noise. So although there's a lot of particles that end up being duplicated and starting at the same point, they uh, very quickly separate from one another because uh, each particle has a different process noise that's added to it for that time forward. So they kind of blow apart, come back together when you're resampling, and then and then continue to blow apart again until they get to the hit that threshold for resampling. Um, this is ugly, though. I mean, it's it's kind of kludgy. The picking a, an arbitrary threshold. Or and then throwing out uh, uh, some particles in a kind of lossy way introduces time steps when your model might be significantly worse than the model at the previous step because you've thrown away a bunch of information and then it takes a couple more steps for the importance weights to adjust based on the, the resampling. A couple steps more for them. I'm, I'm not. I don't think that's right. When you say have the importance weights readjust, when you resample, um, you're resampling with replacement, and and it's um, it's correct. The, the estimate is still accurate to um, to set all the weights equal to a uniform value at that point. I mean, that's that is the right thing to do. I, I agree with you that it, it's ugly and kludgy um, to have this kind of arbitrary threshold that you as an engineer have both the responsibility and obligation as well as the right to pick. You're like, well, I get to, but then I have to defend why I pick the value I picked and how on earth do I justify any value that I pick, you know, on what basis. Um, those, those are, it, it's, it's a valid criticism, but I, I don't know of any better way to do this. I think the resampling is valid in the sense that it doesn't change the, the mean or expectation, but it does increase the variance at, at that step. Increase the variance. Uh, it's, it, it's it should right. I mean, we are we, like we are, it's, it's like quantizing again. I don't think it does. There is there is one of the problems with resampling is that you no longer have particles in improbable parts of the state, right, right, yeah. which may emerge yeah. as large modes. So that's that's called sample impoverishment. Yeah. And so, um, you know, suddenly we're blind to what's happening in this part of the state space, just like we're, we're blind to what's happening up here. So if there's a moat up there, we don't have any particles up there because they all got resampled down here, and now we're not going to be able to see it. Here we have the car kind of going backwards yeah. repeatedly, and, you know, if the car, maybe, maybe at some point this became more likely again. You could imagine uh, with our track, if we had a really bad race car, maybe it's not improbable that it would go backwards all the way back. Uh, as well as, you know, even though we said on average it's going forward, but if I made the average velocity zero, it'd be just as likely to go backwards as forward. And so at some point they're going to join up again. And uh, although the, the way I'm doing the phase, that wouldn't quite be the same, would it? But at least the measurements wouldn't be able to distinguish between those two modes if they came back and joined again. And yet here we would have completely lost that potential mode that we would want to keep tracking. So that, that, that problem is known as sample impoverishment, the fact that all your particles are all bunched up in one part, 
And before we had the problem that a lot of the particles were off in an improbable part of the state and they had very little weight. So we were just burning computational cycles, you know, advancing them forward and calculating their likelihoods when they were very improbable. And so the criticism is you're wasting computer cycles on those particles because they're not doing you any good and, and it's unlikely they ever will. But when you resample and suddenly they all are contributing equally, the flip side of that, the, the other problem that you introduce is now you've got a lot of redundancy. Now you've got a lot of particles that are all in the same mode. And how many particles do you really need to represent a single mode? Uh, you may not need that many. And yet now you've got them all bunched up. If we were doing this with maybe 50,000 particles, which is not unheard of for a lot of these applications, now you've got 50,000 particles, but they're all kind of contributing more or less the same thing. They're just, they're not, you're not getting your, your bang for the buck out of those particles either. So you have, an, in both ways, you've, you've had some loss. So there is, um, there is a trade-off between those two. And people have been thinking a lot about these problems and how to do a good job uh, trading those two things off. But when it comes down to it, um, I don't, I'm, I'm not aware of anyone that has, has really solved that problem and come up with a good way of of not having sample impoverishment where we, we lose modes that may end up having significant area at some point, um, and, uh, and yet also not having a lot of particles where you're burning cycles but their weights are so low that, that they're, they're kind of wasted. Um, ultimately, you probably want a balance of both uh, to some extent, but I don't, I, I, I don't know how to do that. There is something akin to quantization error, though, at least in the, the uh, uniform resampling, because the um, importance weight of a particle uh, that's just a little bit less than the interval needed to get two or three or four new particles after resampling can be different from the importance weight of a particle that's a little bit more than what you would need to get two or three or four after uniform resampling. So at the next step after the sampling, you would see the introduction of error because some particles that didn't quite deserve two will get two, and some particles that deserve a little bit more than two will get two, for example. Are you um, talking about specifically with the single uniform sample that we just went over? I don't know. You because that? that would have quantization error, sure, but I mean, I think you're expecting, it's all statistics, right? You're yeah. all looking at as random numbers converge to whatever the actual, you know. Yeah, but it's true, is. but there's no, there's no error at the limit. But it's worth pointing out that with a finite number of particles and a finite resampling uh, uh, over the, the, the number of particles, you're going to get, with a smaller number of particles, you're going to get some large amount of quantization error yes. with uniform resampling as some particles that didn't deserve a number of new particles after resampling get, uh, get shafted and some particles get overweighted a little bit. So um, I, I, I think the short answer is that across the ensemble, the number of particles that get shafted is the right number. <laughs> <laughs> um, which means in, in probability and in expectation, you're, you're not introducing any kind of systematic bias yeah, but in doing this. It is doing the right thing. It, yeah, it, it is a, in my opinion, it's a legitimate argument to say this, this whole thing is driven by random numbers, and that's insane. Your sampling has random numbers, the uh, advancement of particles through time has random numbers, you've got random number generators all over the place here. And, and you know, here we're in a, a mathematically deep and rigorous discipline, and we're doing optimal tracking with random numbers, at least asymptotically optimal. And that, that still, to me, strikes me as crazy, and yet I don't know of a better way to do it. Yeah. I think this works better than, than anything else for the hardest problems where you've got nonlinear state space models with multimodal posteriors in, uh, in high dimensions. I don't know of any other tracking tool that works well in those applications. I was just thinking that it's, it's, it's just worth pointing out that I think that the step after resampling could actually have worse error than the step before resampling, based on the introduction of additional error by the arbitrariness of the resampling process. I, I don't think that's right. I don't, I don't think it does. I think it's okay. One thing I saw when I was doing the homework is um, if you specify your importance density as the prior, right, and then you graph things so that all the particles have the same weight, right, like you did here in your green graph, right, that's the same thing as saying all the particles have the same weight, visually when you're looking at it, 
And basically, what I realized then is that the particle filter in that case is just simulating a bunch of values running through the state space system, which is the same thing as what we've done in the past in previous classes, where you're just trying to estimate the, um, the stationary expectation, like if you have a stationary process, you're trying to estimate the expectation, right? You, what you do is you simulate a whole bunch of realizations of it, right? So the particle filter is just looking at a bunch of different realizations of your state space system. And then the only part that, which, which making that connection back maybe you feel a little better about the fact that it's all random numbers, because it's basically kind of the same thing of, instead, instead of um, having a stationary process and trying to estimate the expectation from a whole bunch of realizations, you're trying to estimate the expectation given some extra measurements of the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's everything you said is true. Let me just reiterate. Some of what you said. So you said when you pick the importance density, that in some respects can be anything. We want it to be something we can calculate recursively, so we can advance the particles forward in time with a recursive algorithm, and we don't have to go back and generate the entire trajectory. And so we end up with um, with the importance density for advancing it from time n minus one to n. It can be conditioned on whatever we want uh, in in terms of the past of the state or the measurements, the past measurements up to the current measurements. But we often make this choice of setting it equal to the prior. And then you're right. It's, it's basically being driven forward by the process model. And the process model is kind of diverging here. And, and when you do that, the weights are primarily, as, as we'll see later today, uh, affected by the likelihood, which is where the measurements enter. So to expand upon what you were saying that may make you feel even better, um, these particles here <coughs> that are improbable are improbable not because of the process model, but because of the likelihood, because they're inconsistent with the measurement <coughs> And when we, we when the weights are going to zero, it's because they've been inconsistent with our measurement data. And so when we resample them, what we're really doing is picking the particles that were the most consistent with the measurements we've had up until that time. Well, I think they're also, some of them are also improbable because it was improbable for them to happen prior. So it's not just the measurement. Yeah, you're, you're right. It could be that when you're drawing samples from this, you happen to draw samples that are still highly improbable just due to chance. That so can't you divide happen. out the probability from your importance density, though. If your importance density is the prior, you're literally just multiplying the weight by the likelihood That's right. each step. That's right. So with that importance yeah, density, this, yeah, it's not this is true. Because yeah, right. it's only the measurement that's making the weight go down. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But that's only true in that's that only case. Okay, good. Yeah, you're right. It took me a minute to digest that. Just, you're, you're right. Just you're right. That's true. Good point. I'm glad I paused. <laughs> so, with resampling, we've got this kind of yo yo uh, where you can look at it you know, from a number of different perspectives. And again, in, in your homework, you don't really have to plot all these and in your. Um, your presentations, actually any one of these would be enough. Uh, well, m maybe at least the top two, where you see most of the weights are headed to zero, and then we get to resampling step, and they all snap back to being uh, one over the number of particles. Or you could plot what the variance is, and you'll see it climb, and then again it snaps back to a very small number uh, whenever a resampling step is hit. Um, this is usually more useful looking at the number of effective particles and seeing it just kind of drop until we get to whatever your threshold is. And I'm, I'm sorry, but as your instructor, I don't have great guidance about uh, how, to, how to set that threshold. Um, as I mentioned before, the only guidance I can offer is you should think very carefully about your computational budget. That's the limited resource you have. You, know, you, can, you can always spend more computation and get more accuracy, but as engineers, the fundamental trade-off is how do you allocate that computation? You can allocate it to resampling at every time step. That type of particle filter even has its own name. I think it's called the, I've got it in the slides, bootstrap resampling particle or something. We'll, we'll see it shortly. In which case, you know, this would, would kind of coast along at 500, but then you're spending a lot of computation um, on resampling that might otherwise be allocated to particles. And, you know, I don't, I don't know, and it probably depends on your application, whether you're better off waiting so you only resample infrequently and most of your computation is going into kind of a maximizing the number of particles for the computation you have available or, uh, or, or, or not. It, I, I don't know. And it's going to depend on, on your state space model and what you use for the importance density and how much noise you have. There's a lot of different factors that will affect that. <coughs> 
So if you're doing, if you're building a process model for real life, and you're going to take actual measurements, don't you, don't you need to take into account the the sample rate? Because the state at time t plus one, <coughs> that's you know it better match up with your sample rate, correct? And if you if say every certain number of time steps you're taking time out to do this resampling, and that takes a lot of time, next time you come back to to take a measurement, it won't be of the state at t plus 1, it'll be t plus 1 plus delta t. Yeah, uh, fundamentally, um, the answer is yes. Um, when, when you have a continuous time random process, um, the more time that elapses between the, the state at time n plus 1 and n, the more seconds that elapses between those two, the more this is going to, is going to, the more variability you're going to have in this compared to, compared to this. Um, the, the reason I'm having trouble with this is when you, when you think about an autoregressive process, or maybe in its simplest form, even a random walk, you'd say, well, x of n plus 1 is equal to x of n uh, plus some noise, and the variance, the variance of this noise is going to increase the longer the period of time is between n plus 1 and n, which is true. But when you get to a continuous time model of a random walk process, it's really weird because um, between one time and, and between t0 and... Um, I'm sorry, how do I put this? Between... Um, it, it, it's hard to characterize because there's no change from uh, from from a, at time t to t plus delta is how do I explain this? When we think of a random walk process, we're usually thinking about taking a random step of some size and going from n to n plus one. But when you're talking about a continuous time random process, there's no discrete time into the future that you're using to characterize it. You have to characterize it in terms of kind of how rapidly it diverges from its current state. And that, that's tricky. So, um, so part of the reason I hesitate is that um, handling a random walk process or even autoregressive process is far easier in discrete time than it is in continuous time. But your intuition that this noise, the variance of that noise, is going to um, change with the sample rate is absolutely true. And I, I will explain how to do that a little bit later this time. So that's true. The more, the slower your sample rate, the more variability we're going to have. The more that um, that the state of time n plus one is going to differ than what our sort of naive prediction would be before we account for the noise. That's that's true. So another thing is um, usually in your case, right? You have a continuous time state space model, right? And you need to approximate that into the discrete time, right? And so let's just say the simplest possible Taylor's expansion in the first degree. So you have, you know, x to next is equal to x current plus x dot times dt, right? So because you have that f of n in there, and every n your function can change, what you can do is just figure out what dt is and use that to be different for every single time step. So if it took you five seconds to get to the next time step, that's okay, right? That just means that your dt is five times longer. So put dt in the process model. Well, um, just, uh, just discretize the state space model at every time step. Isn't the same as the process changing with n? The process model changing with n? Yeah, because the, it's allowed. Yeah, it's allowed to change the process with n. Right. So if you have a continuous time model, right, and then you want to discretize that, that's a function of the delta in time, right? So there's no point, there's no reason for this to be a uniformly sample process. Your dt can change with every single time step if you wanted it to. And this is the derivative, it's been a while since I've done this. What is this? This um, is the. So you know, if you think of it from a common filter, you have x dot is equal to ax plus bu, right? x dot is equal to? ax plus bu, or I'm sorry, just say ax plus u, right? So this is your um, discrete, this is your continuous time linear state space process, right? If you want to discretize this, the easiest way to discretize that is just say x of k plus 1 is equal to um, x dot t times dt plus x of k minus 1. What's this? That's your um, noise. 
because it's a, it's a process model. So now you've got a continuous time stochastic process. It's a continuous time stochastic um, state space model. Okay. Well, but what I'm wondering about is the U of T. That's is the that noise variance. If you've added a Gaussian noise, well, added a voice noise. Well, what's white noise in continuous time? Uh, okay, it's linear noise. It's, it's uh, <laughs> random noise. Something it's yeah. you know, something else. You still have that in your model, right? We're engineers. We're allowed to say we have white noise in continuous time. Yeah. So okay. Good. That's that's where things get a little bit dicey. Okay, so you're right. But you can, you can discretize that at every time step with whatever your local DT is. Yeah. Good. And I promise we will, we will go through that a little bit later in the term. Like, I've got, I've got that all mapped out for you. So it is coming. We'll see more. Um, all right. Do you guys have any other questions about, about this? And I'm sorry, I know it's ugly to have a threshold. You know, I chose 10% of the number. So I let the number of effective particles drop down to 10% before it hits resampling. I could have chosen anything, and you know, although I like to give my students a hard time for any design decision they make, I can imagine if you guys were up and you're presenting your, your homework or your projects, and you say, and I chose a threshold of 10% uh, of the number of particles, and I raise my hand, why? <laughs> What's your reason for that? Um, I may ask you that. You're, you, you, should, you, should have, you should have a reason. Um, I, I, I get a little bit of a pass, um, only in that um, I'm doing this partly for illustrating how the resampling works, but you can't use that reason. So it, it's not bad to say, well, I don't want to spend a lot of time resampling. Um, I want most of my computational budget to go into the number of particles. And when I set the threshold here, it only resamples maybe every 10 steps. And so most of the computation is still going into the particles themselves, and I'm not burning it on the resampling and the performance is still good. So you may have, um, uh, you, your rationale may be something like that, but you should think it through and have a reason that you're willing to defend before your peers um, as to why you made a decision. And you know the good thing about this is as long as you have a reason, it's not as if someone else could say, well, a better way or a better reason would have been this. You should have done something different because this, this, this one's kind of hard. There's the trade-off between the two. It's just not clear whether the performance would have been better if I set the threshold at, uh, at 50%, for example, so that it, it resamples when we get down to 250 particles. 50 particles is still pretty good if you're only trying to represent um, a couple of modes. I guess that's another way, is to say the minimum number of particles that I would need to, um, to represent a posterior, a multimodal posterior that has, you know, at most at any given time, this multimodal posterior really only has two modes, and having 50 particles is ample if all I want to be able to do is really kind of model two modes, even where, when one is dominant, it's going to have most of the particles in it. As long as I've got, you know, a half dozen particles or so down here, that's probably enough that I'm still going to be <coughs> capturing and tracking that second mode. That, that would be another way that you could reason that through. So um, one thing that I want to emphasize again now that we can, we can go through this more slowly is that this is really, really cool. Like I don't b before particle filters, I don't know. Um, I don't know what you could have done. Like if we say w the posterior can be multimodal, you know, we're going to track it with extended common filter, which people were really excited about doing in the '70s when when that first came out. Everyone's using the extended common filter and spending their time carefully calculating Jacobians, um, and. Uh, and now, you know, there's no Jacobians. You're just, you're throwing computer cycles, which are kind of cheap these days, especially when you, when you have parallel processors. And, uh, and we can look at what the posterior looks like with these density estimation techniques. It works in multiple dimensions. Uh, we can even get confidence intervals. We can track a median instead of a mean really easily if we want to. Like, it's, it's awesome. It's great that we can do this. Um, it's really cool, even even when with the sort of inelegant quirks that I think all of us find a little bit um, ugly and disconcerting. <coughs> so, can you clarify because we just spent like the last slide talking about how you have to carefully pick computer cycles and not burn them on resampling, and now you just said it's 2016 computer cycles are cheap. We just throw more at it. Yeah, yeah, good. Uh, right, uh, you're confusing the heck out of me. Why are you saying all this? Um, so computer cycles are cheap, but when you're in a, when you're tracking a multi-dimensional problem, you're not going to have enough particles. You're always going to want more, and so really, it's a question of um, 
The, uh, my project is due tomorrow. <laughs> I finally just got the code working, and I've got um, a certain amount of time, and I've got a certain amount of processing power. And the, the power times the time is kind of the equivalent of computational energy. It's finite. It's a finite resource that you have to allocate. And so you've got to make a decision as to whether you're going to allocate the finite resource you have to particles or to resampling. It's one of the trade-offs where you've got to make a judgment and decide between those two. But I can tell you, even in 2016, there aren't enough cycles that if you've got a real problem that all of you will have as engineers, where it's multidimensional, you've got maybe a 12-dimensional um, uh, state vector, for example, you know, 12, 20 dimensions is not uncommon, and you've got maybe enough sensors where you've got another dozen sensors, so your measurement vector is maybe that high, um, you're, you're going to run out of computation. Like, it, it will be a finite resource, and especially if you want it to work in real time, whatever your sample rate is that you can afford. Um, if you're running at a certain sample rate, or it has to operate at a certain sample rate, there's another limitation there where you've got to calculate your state estimate within the amount of time, within a sampling interval. And so that's another case where it's not an offline analysis, where it's like, well, I've, this has got to be turned in tomorrow. I can't spend a week on this. Um, but in, in a online tracking application where where um, the truck's going to drive off the road if you if you can't keep up then um, then of course there you've got a, a finite limit too that you've got to stay within so you know are you going to spend that on resampling or are you going to spend that on particles you've got to you've got to think it through and reason it through for your application you will run out of computation even in 2016 we, we don't have any from Intel here do we okay good <laughs> they all got laid off. Yeah, they'll be here next term. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there something here that uh, prevents us from using or changing the number of particles on the fly? No, you can do that. Okay, so uh, you mean uh, one argument you know you, you made a, a little time a while ago was uh, uh, you know depending on the number of modes that that are in the posterior, you can you know uh, get some idea of how many particles you need. Yeah. Or, or, or also probably you can. Um, get an idea of where that point of diminishing returns is. Like, if you increase the number of particles much more, you're not going to get much more accuracy. Yeah, right? um, you can resample, but but then um, if you're not going to use a constant number of particles, and one argument for using a constant number of particles is that you're kind of <laughs> going up against the limit of what you can afford computationally. Why would you do right. any less? Right. Right. And yet you can't do any more, so you get as close to that limit as you can. That yeah. would be one argument in favor. You can adapt the number of particles, right. but if you're going to adapt the number of particles, now you've got to defend whatever right. algorithm or basis you have for adapting the number of particles on the fly. Right. I was thinking that something like, okay, so if, uh, if your posterior has you know, one mode and that's very, you know, very low, uh, variance or right uh, narrow p, then you can probably uh, use less particles at that point. But at some other point, when when you know the possibility is wider, you use those those same cycles for yeah. using more more particles. Yeah, there. that would be cool. Uh, but counting modes automatically is hard. In one dimension is not possible. Um, yeah. Right. I mean, in one dimension maybe, but yeah. you're clearly going to count wrong right. at certain times. Right. But doing it in more than one dimension. Good luck. Right. That's hard. Right. So for all the plots we've been looking at, this is for like one realization, track realization that you generated, right? Would you have to like, you know, so you do that to determine like the number of particles and your threshold for resampling. Should you like repeat that whole process several times for several track realizations to make sure you really have the optimal number of particles? So I want to be very clear. I understand. Uh, it, it, there's a couple of points that um, that that I want to respond to, um, Scott, that you made. Uh, the the first thing is that um, I want to be really clear that although you could have a different number of particles at every time step, I am not advocating for that. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that you go down that road and and say yeah, yes, you have that flexibility. But if you're going to wield that flexibility, you've got to have a sound basis for how you're making that decision. And uh, when you're defending the number of particles, you know, it's kind of the more the better. So you have as many as you can afford for your application. But if you're going to adapt the number of particles for some reason, you've got to defend that. Why would you ever have less than what you can afford? You know, it would be kind of a counter argument against that. 
but um, you can. I'm not. I'm not arguing you should. Um, your idea that it uh, it depends on your particular on the particular realization is true, and in some respects, when we look at this slide, it's a little bit misleading because the only hint of a realization that you have in here is where the true state happened to be in this particular um, example. But really, the realization that you ha should have in mind is not your state trajectory, but rather your your sequence of measurements. Because for a sequence of measurements, that's what gives rise to the posterior. The true state doesn't give rise to this posterior. It's only driven by your measurements and by your state space model. Um, I'm plotting it on here just because we happen to have it. But what your posterior looks like uh, in, in, in some respects has very little to do with what the true state happened to be. But it has a lot to do. I mean, it's directly affected, of course, by your measurements. So if you were to think about multiple realizations, you'd want to think about the weird case where you've got multiple realizations that happen to give rise to exactly the same sequence of measurements, but then just how the state can vary. And, and you can see from the posterior, this essentially gives us a visual image of how the state could vary. Um, but for that set of measurements, if the measurements were different, then, for example, the time at which this split occurs, where we get an ambiguity about where the car is on the track, would, would of course, could occur at a different time. Um, and here we can see the, the car was kind of not going forward and not going backwards, but it wasn't on the edge where we've got an ambiguity. So, you know, that, that's specific to the set of measurements that, that we happen to have. Um, but, um, but you are right that it's specific to the realization, specifically the measurements in our realization, and so you wouldn't, you wouldn't think about creating multiple realizations and having something where the number of particles adapts consistently for all realizations of that random process because we, we don't just have a random process, we've got measurements associated with it, and of course we want to make maximum use of those. Maybe if you're doing post-processing, but even that is taking us down kind of a complicated road, and I, I, in practice I'm not aware of people actually doing that. Two could is a short answer on that, um, yeah. but I don't, I don't know why you would. Well, just to balance the number of cycles, like, you know, uh, use more particles at some point at the expense of, you know, save time. Oh, I see. Yeah, and, yeah. and that would mostly yeah. be if you're doing an offline, yeah. um, a, you know, post-processing right. of data. Right. If you're online, then, you know, from, from this time to that time, usually these systems are designed to operate at a constant sample rate. And so the amount of computation you have per an interval is constant. So then having a fixed number of particles would make sense. Right. Yeah, okay, good. Are, are there ways to calculate like the worst case time? Because like we're getting to the point now where some of this stuff is it's not quite <coughs> as fixed, you know, real time operating system kind of level kind of stuff compared to like an FIR filter or something. Is there, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, what's your question? I did that and finish. Uh, like for stuff like the resampling, can I come up with a worst case time to do that resampling given that, you know, all I know is like the order of the complexity? Um, I think th I think that's hard because how often, if, if you're doing it based on a threshold, for example, the number of effective particles, yeah. how often you hit that threshold is going to depend on, on your particular state space model. Okay, but, yeah. So I don't, you know, I mean, the worst case is every sample. Okay, well, yeah, you're saying, yeah, like the, sort of the resampling, though, the length of time is just a function of the number of particles, so it yeah. change. Yeah. change. So I guess you could do worst case, but the worst case would be based on resampling every time. You can also think about uh, power. You know, if you've got uh, a battery budget, that's a little bit different because then you can burn more power sometimes and less power at other times, and then you might think more on average, what's my burn going to be rather than what's the worst case? Or if you have yeah. a vehicle that's on or off, and then sometimes there's a space. Right, yeah, that's right. Well, if you had a, the resampling, not the resampling, the particle advancement protocol is, algorithm is deterministic. It's the same amount of time every time. The, the, the randomness injected into the computation, in this case, is the, uh, the, the resampling and when you resample. So if you knew how many cycles resampling process takes, and that's also deterministic, the length of time is deterministic, just when it happens, it's not. So if you know the number of time, that the, the, the length of time that the, that the resampling takes, and you know the length of time that your computation step takes, you could say, worst case scenario, I'd have to drop two time steps of data in order to get a resampling in, and then my delta t would degrade to some level. And you might have to do that continuously, but you could still 
measure that in the worst case. And if I heard you correctly, I was with you until the end when you talked about changing delta T. And if I heard you correctly, I think what you're talking about is um, because resampling takes more time, maybe what you would trade off instead is, um, is to change your sample rate, effectively, your sampling interval. So rather than maybe updating it at 100 hertz, maybe occasionally you slow that down and you update it at 50 hertz or 25 hertz. So then yeah. you have a non-uniform sample rate. It's yeah. possible. Not intentionally, just retroactively saying, OK, well, I had to spend the last three cycles re resampling. So I'll drop those three cycles, pretend yeah. my time step is different, advance all of my particles based on the different time step of the samples that are the cycles that I dropped, and then, um, and then resume as normal to the extent possible. But you could compute what the worst case, uh, uh, the worst case delay or degradation in your performance would be from a real-time perspective. Okay, good. Um, and that, that kind of raises a, a larger point. So one of the cool things about the general framework that we're working in right now is that the um, process model can be time varying. I'm putting that a different color to emphasize it. And this is the way in which you could accommodate the fact that maybe the, the real-time interval in going from n to n plus 1 is changing over time. Maybe sometimes you're moving this ahead um, uh, 10 milliseconds, and sometimes you're moving it ahead 20 milliseconds. Um, additionally, the, um, the distribution of your process noise can also change every time step. So it may be that this is changing as well. And if we're modeling this as a normal distribution with zero mean, the only thing that would be changing in that distribution then would be the variance. And that can change as well for every time step. So although we're, we're looking at this in discrete time, and probably what most of us have in mind is an application where things are operating at a constant sample rate, the framework is actually flexible enough that if you were going from a continuous time process to discrete time, that this could accommodate a non-uniform sampling, or yeah, non-uniform sample rate. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all true, and that's, that's a good point. And it seems like you guys are, are eager to see how this relates to continuous time processes. Maybe I should cover that sooner rather than later. Good. Um, anything, any, any other thoughts about this example that we went through last time? Okay. I, I hope you guys feel like you've got a pretty good hand now on particle filters. This is, again, the, uh, from the optimal, from doing the numerical integration and having the optimal posterior. We look at them side by side, and, you know, suddenly with the resampling, despite how inelegant it seems, uh, does really a beautiful job. Um, for only 500 particles of representing the posterior. And if I had chosen 5,000 particles, which would be uh, totally feasible, I mean, that would be easy with today's computational resources, then this image might even be indistinguishable from this image. Um, so, but it is only in one dimension, and everything always gets harder in high dimensions. Um, dimensionality uh, gets worse at a faster rate than the rate at which our computation, computational resources increase, so we will we, we'll never win the race. Um, so that was, that was it. Um, that's the basic, and that basic algorithm with the, what, what I'm calling here the systematic resampling algorithm, like, if the class ended right now and you just got really skilled at applying this to practical problems, if we did nothing but problems with this one algorithm from this point through the rest of the term, um, the other advances and the fancy things that we'll talk about um, this is the most powerful and simplest algorithm that, that I'm going to convey to you. I mean, the, the, for me, this instructor, the re part of the reason I really like this class is the very first or maybe the second or third thing that we cover. Here we are um, at, is this fourth week? So we're at the end of the fourth week. We're 40% 40 40 of way, the way through the term. And you now have in your hands like the most powerful technique we're going to talk about all term. This, this works well. You can make improvements, but the improvements are marginal. This gets you kind of 90% of the way there. And so, um, so I'm really looking forward to the homework presentations on Tuesday and the ones to follow where you'll be doing this in, in multiple dimensions as well. Like, you've, you've got it. That's it. It's in your hands now. You can, you can track really well with this. Just use a lot of particles. <laughs>
So um, if there's no further questions, then uh, let's take our break now, and then we'll talk about um, a better way of picking importance densities, sort of. <laughs>